Okay, so let's move on to the final lateral directional stability moment. This is the yaw moment. We start off in exactly the same way as we have been doing throughout. We define our yaw moment in the steady state condition as a yaw moment coefficient multiplied by the uh, dynamic pressure wing reference area. And again, we characterize this based on the wing span. This yaw moment coefficient here, again, is a function of the side slip angle, aileron deflection angle, and rudder deflection angle. Again, we can apply a Taylor series expansion to this thing to get this expression here. And again, considering that we have X, Z uh, plane um, symmetry on our aeroplane, that means if the side slip angle is zero, we have no aileron or rudder input, um, then this uh, yaw coefficient is going to be zero so this term goes to zero and then we have these three terms here which we're, again we're going to deal with separately so they're your moment coefficients due to side slip due to aileron deflection and due to rudder deflection so exactly the same uh, kind of setup as you have seen for the um, the roll moment coefficients right so first of all let's deal with term number one the your moment coefficient due to side slip so this is known as the weathercocking effect um, because um, basically the side slip coming from one side of the aircraft can um, rotate the aircraft in the uh, yawing sense around the center of gravity position. And so basically what we do to model this um, quite complicated coefficient here is split it up into the contributions from the wing, body, horizontal tail and vertical tail separately and then we deal with them um, individually. It's a little bit easier to understand that way. So we start off here, well we'll start off with the easy ones, the ones that we can approximate as zero. First of all the contribution um, of the yaw moment coefficient due to side slip on the wing. So generally we can consider this to be zero um, because the difference in side slip on the right wing versus the left wing is pretty negligible and therefore it doesn't produce a significant yawing moment in either direction. So this one we can assume to be zero, unlike when we had the roll moment coefficient and we uh, have wing dihedral, the corresponding term doesn't necessarily um, generalize as zero, but in this case it does. The next thing that we can assume to be zero, again, is the contribution from the horizontal tail because typically we don't have any um, dihedral on the horizontal tail. Again, the F4 is an exception to this rule. So now let's have a look at the contribution from the body then. This is where the main weathercocking effect comes from. So here we have certain portion of the airflow hitting the side of the fuselage from the right hand side that's positive beta right positive side slip coming from the right hand side of the pilot and we have a certain portion of that side slipped flow hitting the aft section of the fuselage right so behind the center of gravity position remember that's affected by side wash as well so not only do we have to consider the proportion of the fuselage ahead of the center of gravity position, but we also have to consider the uh, effect on the aft section of the uh, fuselage and how that's affected by side wash. So that's characterized by this equation down here where um, we've seen these coefficients before. This is the length of the fuselage, LB, um, and SBS is the, I should write this on here actually, that's the side um, area of the fuselage, so side on. Um, and then these two coefficients, the Ks, um, are found again from eyeballing charts. Those are given in the textbooks, figures uh, 4.68 and 4.69 respectively. This one is based um, on more geometric um, characteristics of the aircraft, so um, height and width of the fuselage, for example, um, X distance from the nose to the center of gravity position and some of these other coefficients like the Z, so the height of the fuselage at 25% of the length of the body, height of the fuselage at 75% of the length of the body, and so on. And this one 
the K sub RE L is based only on the Reynolds number, uh, where the Reynolds number is calculated based on the length of the fuselage. So that characterizes this one. So then let's finally have a look at the yaw moment coefficient due to side slip on the vertical tail. So this is the main effect in this equation because we could potentially have quite a quite a large um, vertical tail which is exposed to um, this positive beta angle in this case which is um, yawing the aircraft in the positive direction so remember positive yaw is where the nose turns to the right so positive side slip angle makes positive yaw moment and therefore we can find the contribution of that moment based on the moment arm from the aerodynamic center of the vertical tail to the center of gravity position multiplied by the force. So this is the lateral force coefficient um, due to side slip on the vertical tail. So force times the moment arm gives us the moment. So all of that stuff goes into there. That's um, coefficient number one. Now let's deal with coefficients two and three. So first of all, Number two, the yaw moment coefficient due to aileron deflection. So, the yaw moment coefficient due to aileron deflection is a result of the asymmetric deflection on the elevators and how they change, well, drag essentially. So, um, you'll see in this equation here, um, this characterizes the net yawing effect due to the aileron deflection and it's based on terms that we've already found. So this one, well, with the exception of this one, which we need to look up in the uh, textbook, again from the charts, but we've seen these coefficients crop, crop up before, right? This is the inboard and outboard location of the ailerons, aspect ratio, and the taper ratio. So that one we look up from the charts. These two we've derived previously. So we have the steady state lift coefficient, so again, the ailerons are producing equal and opposite lift, right, if they're, if they're working opposing each other. And then this is the roll moment coefficient due to the aileron deflection, which we derived in the previous section. So that's a reasonably straightforward one. Once we know that, that can be put straight into there. And then finally, the third one, which is the, roll, the yaw moment coefficient due to um, rudder deflection, this is actually the largest contributor to that equation and obviously the rudder is the key control surface for yaw. So if we deflect our rudder, positive means trailing edge to the left. That makes a lateral force in the positive y direction but behind the center of gravity position so that yaws the aircraft to the left. Yawing the aircraft to the left, i.e. nose to the left, is negative. And again, we can characterize that moment by working out the moment arm, this time to the aerodynamic center of the rudder. So remember, this is due to rudder deflection. Before, when we were dealing down here, we were dealing with um, your moment due to side slip on the vertical tail, which is why we considered the aerodynamic center of the vertical tail here. But now we're considering the aerodynamic center of the rudder up here. There's a moment arm associated with it because now we're defining these with subscript R's, right, for rudder, rather than subscript S's, right? Um, so vertical tail with S's is with respect to the aerodynamic center of the vertical tail up here, R's for rudder. And again, we can characterize this coefficient with basically a force. Um, this is the lateral force on the, on the rudder multiplied by the moment arm that we get from these two um, parameters. So therefore we have expressions for each of those three terms inside that equation. We can go ahead and calculate our uh, yaw moment coefficient in the uh, steady state. So one final thing to mention about all of this, you'll see an example in a moment, but this coefficient is the main design requirement for vertical tails and rudders, particularly on passenger aircraft, because uh, the designers would like to maintain, or it's a requirement that the design is able to maintain um, your control 
following uh, an engine failure. So if you get an engine failure on one uh, one side, obviously you've got a, a asymmetry in thrust there, which is going to induce a yaw moment. So you need to have enough rudder deflection and enough um, tail vertical tail surface area in order to give you control and stability in the event of that engine failure. So we've just discussed how that in commercial aviation at least uh, vertical tail design and rudder design is driven mainly by the necessity to maintain uh, your control and lateral directional stability in the event of an engine failure which gives you uh, an asymmetry in thrust. Well there was a particularly famous incident where um, this was the kind of opposite situation if you like. So this was the uh, very famous uh, McDonnell Douglas DC-10 accident that was the uh, United Airlines Flight 232 uh, schedule from Denver to Chicago in July of 1989. Uh, what happened in this particular accident was a catastrophic failure of the third engine, which is the one that's mounted on the vertical tail, exploded mid-flight and uh, took out the whole vertical tail, severed hydraulic links to the control systems and so on. and basically left the pilots with no uh, no control over the aircraft via the, the, the usual control surfaces. So obviously they had no vertical tail, so no rudder left, the elevators were not working, and the ailerons were not moving either. So uh, initially after the explosion the aircraft started to pull and bank to the right um, and entered uh, a fugoid cycle, which we'll discuss when we get on to discussing the modes. Um, so uh, the pilots and um, actually a passenger who was a DC-10 instructor and very experienced DC-10 pilot came up to the cockpit and with some very successful crew resource management managed to vector the, the thrusts from the two remaining engines to level the, the aircraft off and essentially, um, essentially try to crash land the aircraft in Sioux City, Iowa. And the crash landing was reasonably successful given the limited, very limited control they had of the aircraft. And they managed to um, descend the aircraft. They originally aimed for one, one runway but due to the, the limited control they had they, they opted for another one. Missed it slightly as it was quite difficult to, to, to line it up. They also feared that they weren't going to get the landing gear down. Um, but basically it was a reasonably successful crash landing given the, the enormous problems that the pilots had in flight there. And they managed to save 184 people uh, of a total of nearly 300. Um, most of the people uh, that um, died actually were in the pieces of the fuselage that broke off. You can see in this middle diagram here uh, the, the main section of the aircraft, the wings and the, the middle part of the fuselage remained pretty much intact and the most, most of the survivors were in, were in that part. Um, the, the majority of those that were killed were in the, the parts of the fuselage in the nose and in the tail which broke off. So that's just another example of how you can use engine thrust vectoring to essentially control the um, yaw and roll of the aircraft. Obviously this was a very um, devastating incident um, and was one in a long line of very uh, famous DC-10 accidents. Um, but again, just shows you a good example of um, kind of unconventional uh, control of an aircraft.